Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Today's topic is COPD, a hidden health threat. And it is a timely one because November is uh, COPD Awareness Month. We have an excellent speaker today, and uh, we're very happy to uh, welcome him. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him in just a few minutes. But first, we want to thank our sponsors. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by Care Choices, Hospice, and Palliative Services, O'Connor Mortuary, Caring Companions at Home, and Alzheimer's Orange County. And as most of you know, uh, these sponsors provide the webinars to us on a monthly basis as a service to the community on topics related to aging, Alzheimer's disease, um, topics of interest that are beneficial to anyone who cares for and, and works with older adults. So we hope that you'll find today's presentation informative and useful. And um, I'm Kim Bailey. Let me tell you a little bit our, about our speaker. He is Mike Hess. He is the Senior Director of Public Outreach and Education at the COPD Foundation. A respiratory therapist by training, he also holds a master's of public health degree from Western Michigan University, which enables him to focus on improving access to care for all those living with chronic respiratory conditions. In 2018, Mike started the Think COPD program, a partnership between the National Institutes of Health and uh, West Med Health in Kalamazoo, Michigan, aimed at bringing lung screenings and educational events to the underserved communities in southwestern Michigan. Now with the COPD Foundation, Mike leads the Oxygen 360 Project, an interprofessional collaboration aimed at fostering innovation in oxygen therapy technology, as well as improving access and awareness. And I'm very pleased at this time to introduce you to Mike Hess, to bring him on screen and turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Mike, and welcome. Well, thank you, Kim. That was a, a fantastic introduction. It's a pleasure for me to, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> off to a really good start here. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here today with everybody. As Kim mentioned, November is COPD Awareness Month. We're coming up on World COPD Day next week. And so this is a really exciting time to talk about uh, an important topic that uh, admittedly I'm a little biased as part of the foundation, but um, I really do think that this is uh, truly a hidden health threat um, because we simply need to do a better job of raising awareness about a lot of the, the aspects to this condition. So uh, without further ado, let's start getting into this. And some of this may be some review um, for, for folks who maybe have worked with a lot of uh, COPD people um, or who are very familiar with the condition, but it's always good to uh, kind of take a step back and look at the, the overall condition on uh, the overall picture just to make sure that, oh, uh, shoot, click the wrong button there for a moment. Sorry about that. Um, just to make sure we're all on the, on the same page here. So what is COPD? Of course, um, we have, uh, this affects the lungs. It is a chronic pulmonary condition, as it says on the box. Um, so we look uh, deeper into the anatomy here, and we usually see that uh, there are two main components to the lungs that are really affected by this. First of all, we have the alveoli, uh, where all my respiratory instructors would always say that the good air goes in and the bad air goes out. Uh, it's where the gas exchange actually takes place and the interface with the circulatory system happens. We see, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the details of the damage in the next slide, but we see that. And then we also see uh, issues with the airways themselves, the bronchi. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the terminology here. We talk about emphysema, which is where we have, this is where the alveolar damage takes place. We see a couple of different uh, types of damage here. Most commonly, we see what's called alveolar consolidation, where some of the walls break down with some of the smaller alveoli, and they really turn into uh, um, just a instead of a bunch of grapes, they turn into kind of just this cluster of an uh, inelastic, uh, uh, floppy uh, air gas exchange areas. <clears throat> And so unfortunately, what we see is we, we lose a lot of the, the ability to exchange gas, a lot of the ability to get the oxygen in, the carbon dioxide out, simply because there's far less surface area. With some of this consolidation, we also see a loss of elastic recoil. And so it's much more difficult to actually get air out 
uh, and hence the obstruction in, in COPD. And of course, if you can't get the old air out, it's difficult to take a deeper for a breath of fresh air in. And so that's why we see kind of that, that chronic uh, carbon dioxide buildup and often some hypoxia or hypoxemia with these folks. And again, uh, the other major component of this is called chronic bronchitis. And we can see a comparison slide here on the left is uh, your normal airway. Um, with the uh, uh, the cells and the cilia lining the airway. And then over on the right, we see some of the damage that takes place, uh, which does look a, a couple of different, takes a couple of different uh, forms. Uh, first off, we see a lot more uh, mucus hypersecretion, we call it, um, where we just uh, have a lot of this buildup because after constant uh, ongoing damage, the lungs are and the airways are in a uh, never ending battle to try and fight that damage and try to repair it. And of course, one of the main ways to do that is to create more mucus to try to trap some of the irritants and that sort of thing. We also see damage to the cilia, the little hairs that line the airways, uh, because, you know, again, uh, much of COPD is caused by smoking. Probably about 80% of the cases is caused by smoking or caused by smoking. Um, and so if you're inhaling hot gas, it's probably, it's not that much of a stretch to, uh, to realize that uh, that's going to cause some damage to the finer tissues of that airway, and that includes the cilia. So again, we have uh, an impairment of the ability of the airways to clear out those irritants, the smoke particles, and everything else, uh, because there simply aren't enough cilia to get the job done. And then we see that little call out there of the extra goblet cell. Those are the mucus secreting uh, cells that align the airways. Uh, and that's what leads us to our increased mucus. Finally, uh, we see that inflammation uh, around the airways there in the muscles uh, and in the tissues surrounding that. So th this is kind of the main components to, uh, to COPD. Uh, most people have some mix of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. It's rare to see, uh, you know, we used to talk about the, this idea. We had these these people called uh, uh, blue bloaters and they were the chronic bronchitics and we had the pink puffers and they were the emphysema folks. But uh, um, really it's, it's fairly uncommon to see this uh, distinct uh, phenotype like that because most people have some degree of both. And then we can also throw uh, some forms of chronic asthma, uh, some forms of a condition called bronchiectasis where the airways are uh, not, uh, they, instead of getting thicker, they actually get a little floppier and little pockets of chronic uh, infection pile up in there. So it is this, it's, it's an evolving definition of COPD, but uh, predominantly we see uh, these two uh, uh, processes uh, most of the time. Now, of course, the, the impact of this is a, a little bit more uh, graphically represented here. On the very left, we see uh, normal alveoli, normal airways doing their thing. As they inhale, they expand. As you exhale, they retract, kind of like uh, blowing up an old school latex balloon. Um, they, uh, the alveoli actually work very similar to that. On, um, it's that that's why you don't have to work very hard to exhale most of the time. We have that good elastic recoil, and we don't have much getting in the way. As we get over into the bronchitis zone there, uh, we see an accumulation of various shades of mucus um, piling up there and impeding that airflow. And we can see that the lungs just aren't expanding as properly as they should. And then all the way on the far right, we see uh, where we've had that consolidation. We don't have as many distinct alveoli anymore. We certainly don't have as much of that elastic recoil. Uh, and we just kind of see that uh, sad kind of deflating. Instead of a latex balloon, it's more like a, a trash bag or something like that, it's just kind of slowly deflating and leading to a lot of uh, subjective shortness of breath. Now, why do we care about this so much? Why do we talk about this being a hidden health threat? Well, quite simply because we have a pretty significant uh, COPD footprint uh, on the country here. We can see uh, those states shaded in red, including where I'm uh, talking to you from right now in Michigan, have uh, some of the highest prevalence in the country. And this is this is diagnosed prevalence of the, the population. So we figure um, nationwide, about one in 10 people have been diagnosed with COPD. And you can see that uh, there are certain states that uh, um, um, hit that mark very readily and some that are right behind that. We also know uh, overall there are about 30 million people who live with COPD, but the reason that this is a hidden health threat is because half those folks are undiagnosed. Um, unfortunately, the, the and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, um, 
COPD can be can present kind of non-specifically at first, um, and it's very difficult, especially considering we have a lack of awareness um, that we're working on right now, as a matter of fact. Um, but because we have that relatively low awareness and because we have relatively uh, non-specific symptoms, we often see very delayed diagnosis until somebody, uh, in some cases, is actually going into the hospital for their first exacerbation. Uh, it's one of those things that uh, you know we often don't think about our breathing until we absolutely have to. And unfortunately, that is when we see a lot of the diagnoses take place. Looking at some of the, the demographics of the COPD footprint here, um, we can see, and uh, part of the reason I'm talking to you folks today is because this does tend to be um, a disease of the older population. Um, we rarely see it in, uh, certainly we rarely see it in the 18 to 44 crowd. We start seeing it around age 45, but even then um, we see that uh, that's usually a little bit early. Again, just because uh, first of all, it takes a while for symptoms to manifest. And again, we also, also often have that, uh, uh, that uh, um, delayed diagnosis. So then we, once we start getting into 50s and 60s, we start seeing that that's really where we hit uh, that uh, that 10 percent mark, and we start seeing a, a larger proportion of the population uh, being diagnosed uh, with the condition. Uh, we can see that uh, um, you know there are some variances depending on your ethnicity. Um, whether how the relevance of that is somewhat uh, unclear at this point. What is interesting is that, especially in the last five to 10 years, we have seen a market upswing in the number of women who have been diagnosed with COPD. Um, there's, that is, of course, a, a, a question of, of great interest for the COPD research community is exactly why are we seeing that? Is it, uh, the, and there are a couple of different theories, one of which is uh, just basic genetics. We suspect that women have a more severe response to COPD. Um, just again, something something in the genes. Um, women tend to have more flare-ups, exacerbations. They tend to be more severe, um, tend to have greater baseline symptoms. We don't entirely know why. Um, and again, also because this has happened in the last, again, probably 10 years or so, we, there's also some suspicion that um, roughly in the, the late 70s and into the 1980s, when we saw um, women, you know, cigarettes being targeted more specifically to women um, and, uh, you know, all that, uh, that sort of thing, uh, their exposures were increased significantly. So we don't know exactly why this happens, but uh, it is something to, to bear in mind uh, as we continue to look for the, uh, the missing millions of people who are dealing with COPD. So what burden does COPD place on those who have been diagnosed? Well, again, this is a big deal because nearly 20% of people who have been diagnosed with COPD uh, have been hospitalized for it at some point. And of course, that is a major concern um, in the healthcare system, particularly right now. I mean, we're already seeing that uh, healthcare systems are, are swamped in, in many parts of the country um, with uh, that which shall not be named. Um, but we see that uh, obviously COPD does place a great burden on the system. And of course, you know, again, this is where a lot of people are initially getting diagnosed. Once you have that diagnosis, our job uh, and on the RT side of things, and of course uh, our great uh, partners with the nurses, this is also a nurse practitioner week. Um, so shout out to the NPs out there. Um, but that's our job to keep people from going back into the hospital, certainly. 64.2% uh, of folks who have been diagnosed have said that COPD affects their quality of life. Now this one, um, you know, our, possibly is kind of a no-brainer. I mean, if you have a condition that affects literally every breath you take, it's probably going to affect your quality of life because we're starting to talk about activity limitation. We're starting to talk about frequent cough in places where you're not supposed to cough, like church or concerts or things like that. Again, this day and age, you know, when you walk by somebody who's coughing a lot, uh, COPD might not be the first thing that jumps to mind. So uh, we start to see people uh, um, starting to get isolated. Uh, because they don't want to embarrass themselves in those situations, and also because it can be logistically difficult to travel around with COPD, particularly when you get into some of the more advanced phases where maybe you're using oxygen therapy or you need uh, frequent uh, nebulizer medications. 
um, it can be difficult to bring those things with you. And so people start to kind of withdraw a little bit and isolate even from friends and family. And so we see mental health issues also of great concern uh, with, the, uh, with the COPD community. And finally, on this slide, um, again, probably not terribly surprising, but over 50% take at least one daily medication. Um, now, I, honestly, when I first saw this statistic, I was a little bit surprised in that it was so low. Um, you know, we, we do know that much like cases of mild asthma, uh, those folks who may have relatively mild cases of COPD might not necessarily need a lot of meds, but I would say that the, most of the people who have anything other than very mild COPD uh, use at least one daily controller inhaler or maintenance inhaler, we call it, or nebulizer, uh, but one maintenance medication. And we also know that a lot of folks with COPD have a variety of concurrent conditions because again, think about if you have activity limitation, um, think about all the conditions that go along with um, being sedentary. Um, we start to look at obesity, we start to look at diabetes, we start to look at uh, deconditioning. Um, and we also see a lot of uh, uh, malnutrition going the other way because if you are expending all of your energy shopping on putting things away and food prep and everything else, you might not have enough energy to actually cook the food that you just bought. Or you're because you're working so hard to breathe constantly, your metabol you're expending so many calories that it's difficult to keep up with that. So, you know, again, even outside of the, the three concepts on this slide, um, COPD really has a huge impact on a variety of uh, lifestyle factors. And of course, uh, the elephant in the room here, uh, COPD, uh, all things uh, aside, all external factors aside, is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States, as well as around the world. Um, so, but unfortunately it ranks, uh, we were just looking at this number, I believe it was 157th in research funding from NIH. So again, this kind of contributes to the idea of this being uh, sort of a hidden epidemic um, kind of an issue with uh, um, um, uh, trying to get people more aware of this so that we can improve diagnosis, so that we can catch people earlier, and so that the general public can be more aware of what to look for. So kind of along those lines, what are we looking for? What are some of the risk factors here? Well, we talked a little bit before about this does tend to be a disease of relatively older folks. And now I'm putting myself in there because I am also 40 plus. Uh, I am not uh, the spring chicken I once was back in the day. Um, but this does tend to be, uh, it does tend to take a while for these symptoms to manifest in a clinically significant way. Um, and, and so that leads to some issues too, because, you know, let's say when you're young and foolish, you decide to take up smoking uh, and you smoke for five years or so and you end up quitting. And uh, congratulations to everyone out there who has been able to kick that habit. And then you might not think about it for a while. And then you start getting into uh, your uh, 40 plus zone here. And you start having some of that shortness of breath uh, when you don't expect to. Uh, and you have some of the, uh, the the lack of endurance and all that sort of thing, uh, probably the first thing on your mind is, boy, I actually am starting to get older. Maybe I'm a little out of shape. Maybe, you know, my gym has been closed for six months and, you know, I haven't been uh, keeping up with that or I've got other factors going on. Uh, if you're a, a long time non-smoker, uh, you might not immediately think of a problem with your actual lungs before you start looking at some other factors. So again, uh, impacting that delayed diagnosis. Smoking, of course, uh, is one of the, the biggest ones, uh, at least in the, in the developed world, as we, as we call it. Uh, in countries like the U.S., uh, COPD is uh, most uh, about 80% uh, of all COPD cases are caused by tobacco smoke, um, which, you know, again, was a, a huge uh, risk uh, or hidden risk, I guess, uh, was hidden from us uh, for a very long time uh, up until those 80s and 90s when we started being a little bit more honest about some of the risk factors here. However, where do we get that other 20% from? Well, we get it from occupational exposures or in certain parts of the world, including in, in certain parts of the United States and, and the developed world, we get it from environmental factors or we get it from things like uh, biomass uh, fuel burning. Um, I have a, a cottage in, in rural northern Michigan, 
where uh, many of the the, uh, the homes in the community still rely on wood burning stoves and not necessarily the, the cleaner burning pellet stoves or anything like that, but actual old school chop down the tree uh, wood stoves. And so without proper ventilation, you know, sometimes you might get a little bit of ex extra smoke exposure, or perhaps you live in a, in a more populated area where you have a lot of uh, traffic issues and you have a lot of industrial pollutants. Um, we haven't fully elucidated the risk factors of air pollution, but we know that they're there based again on some observations we've seen uh, from other parts of the world and from uh, even parts of our own backyard. And finally, uh, one of the most hidden uh, of the hidden uh, uh, issues with COPD is a condition that uh, we usually call alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Sometimes we call it genetic COPD. Uh, and this is a condition where um, your a genetic mutation actually um, uh, produces malformed uh, protein, alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, that accumulates in the liver. Now, alpha-1 antitrypsin generally kind of balances out uh, neutrophil elastase in the lungs, which is one of, a part of our immune response. Um, and so without alpha-1 antitrypsin to counteract that elastase, uh, that really starts going to work on lung tissue. And so we see emphysema-like damage uh, in those younger populations. That's where we started to see where, you know, if you have somebody uh, who suddenly uh, presents to you and is looking like they've been a um, two-pack-a-day smoker for 40 years, but they're only 35, uh, that's when you should start thinking about maybe um, alpha-1 antitrypsin screening. It's a very simple process, but only about one in 10 people uh, who actually have the deficiency ever get uh, diagnosed with it. So, um, but it's literally a cheek swab that you send into a lab and, and you can get uh, uh, some preliminary screening done with that. Um, so that's my alpha-1 soapbox for the day. Um, definitely something to look out for, um, especially with people who don't necessarily have a lot of other risk factors or perhaps have a very long family history of lung disease of one stripe or another. So what are we looking for when you have some of these early warning signs of COPD? Well, of course, one of the first things is frequent coughing. Um, you know, especially if it's unexplained. Now, sometimes this can go um, hidden for a variety of reasons, including, uh, well, my allergies are just getting worse or things like that. But um, this is also where we start to look for that kind of stereotypical smoker's cough, where uh, somebody has been relatively sedate while they've been uh, sleeping overnight. They get up, everything starts flowing around, everything starts moving, and they have that big hacking productive cough first thing in the morning. Uh, kind of, uh, you know, sometimes things become uh, cliches uh, be for a reason, and this is kind of why uh, this is one of those things. This is that frequent cough. In addition to that, we see uh, wheezing and chest tightness, because while this isn't necessarily a, a hallmark of, uh, of uh, like, like asthma has wheezing as a hallmark, um, COPD is not necessarily like that, but it can be because there are some very similar uh, presentations and some very similar pathophysiologies at work. Uh, sometimes we do see that bronchospasm and that bronchoconstriction much like we would see with asthma. Uh, sometimes we actually see a condition that we call asthma COPD overlap uh, where you actually do have some allergic response to it and you also have some, some chronic response as well. Um, and it, it's very difficult to kind of thread the needle sometimes and figure out exactly which one is uh, the, the bigger factor. Um, but sometimes it also doesn't really matter as long as we're treating those symptoms. Going along with wheezing, because you can't necessarily get the air out as well, you also have that chest tightness because you're always kind of walking around in this state of hyperinflation unless you do some breathing exercises to kind of uh, 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 flush out the stale air a little bit better. Your chest always just seems very big, and when it's very big, it gets very tight, uh, feels very tight. Also, of course, shortness of breath for, again, a variety of reasons. If we have uh, carbon dioxide buildup, if we have a uh, relatively low oxygen level, um, if we're just, uh, you know, not sleeping very well, because that's another thing, and we'll talk about excessively tired there in a minute. Um, you know, we see all of these things going along as COPD warning signs. Um, and so I'll jump in and I'll talk about uh, being excessively tired because COPD can also significantly mess with your sleep hygiene. Because again, um, 
COPD doesn't go to sleep. It's going to be bothering your lungs 24 hours a day, clearly. And so if you're having issues while you're awake, it's reasonable to think that you're going to have issues while you're asleep. And we also see, much like we see asthma and COPD overlap, we see conditions like obstructive sleep apnea and COPD overlap as well. So, you know, again, the, these are relatively nonspecific, so you can probably start to uh, uh, appreciate the difficulties that we have with getting some of these early diagnosis, diagnostic processes done um, because, you know, again, you have somebody who coughs all the time. Well, do they have COPD? Do they have post-nasal drip? Do they have lung cancer? Do they have bad allergies that are uncontrolled? Do they have undiagnosed asthma? Uh, do they have 8,000 other things? Um, you're excessively tired. Well, do you have sleep apnea? Do you have COPD? Do you have, uh, are you stressed? Are you, you know, do you have uh, any one of a dozen issues? that can contribute to this so um you know again all in all it can be very difficult to uh to treat these warning signs with the gravity that they deserve um, but uh, it is something that uh, behooves us all to be paying attention to with those warning signs in mind how do we actually separate the wheat from the chaff how do we figure out whether it's it is actually copd or, or if it's something else and really, the best way to do that um, is with a, a pulmonary function testing, usually what's called spirometry. Um, oftentimes, you'll send somebody to an actual specialized pulmonary function lab for this because there are some other tests that can be done with that equipment. But spirometry can also be done in virtually any setting. It can be done right in an office setting. Uh, when I was at WMED, as we were talking about in my introduction, a part of our community uh, lung screening events, we actually had portable devices that we could take out to health fairs or to uh, we, we went to homeless shelters. We went to all kinds of places uh, to try to find some of these folks and get them connected with better healthcare access. These devices are relatively um, small, they're very portable, and they can do a really nice job in helping us figure out exactly what's going on. Because what we do is essentially you have somebody take a breath in maximally, and then you tell them to blow out as hard and fast as they can. And what we do is we measure the amount that comes out in the first second. We call it the forced expiratory volume in one second, or FEV1. And we compare that to what is blown out throughout the course of the entire breath, which should last at least six seconds, uh, depending on exactly how that elastic recoil is working out. You might actually see it more along the lines of, of 10 or 11 seconds. But we compare those values because we want to look and make sure that at least 70% is coming out in that first second. Uh, because all of our epidemiological data that have been uh, accumulated over the decades tells us that is uh, what we should be looking for. If it's above 70, then you have relatively normal lungs, or at least you don't have any obstruction. Uh, but if it's below 70, there's something going on that is, uh, again, obstructing that airflow and making it so that uh, the air cannot escape. Now, in recent years, there have been a couple of other uh, kind of diagnostic paradigms that have popped up. Uh, simply because while spirometers are pretty accessible, they're pretty portable, they're pretty available, we do see a lack of access to them um, simply, well, for a variety of reasons. Uh, some clinicians um, aren't aware of it. Uh, some practices uh, have historically not been able to afford it, uh, despite that there are a variety of, of less expensive options right now. Uh, you might not have staffing for it. Uh, there are a variety of reasons, but uh, Usually between about 50 and 60% of practices say that they're not using spirometry um, because they don't have the devices. But again, um, I'll put on my pulmonary function hat for a minute and encourage everybody out there to, uh, who is in a clinic or in, a, in an office, uh, try to get spirometry done because this is not one of those things that you just want to um, diagnose just by symptoms because again, they are so very nonspecific. I'll give you a little anecdote here. I think we're I think we're doing okay in time, so I'll tell you a little bit of a story here from from my clinic days, uh, where we actually I had a patient come in who had um, about a two year history of uh, she they had had uh, allergies for many years, for about the last two years they had had this chronic cough. Um, couldn't really explain it, uh, chalked it up to symptoms. They worked at the, the, the library bookstore or public library bookstore. Um, so they thought, well, maybe it's the older books or, you know, something going on, but uh, also had a smoking history back in the day. And so didn't want to rule anything out. So 
uh, we we tried a medication. Um, the spirometer happened to be down that day, of course, when, when, she first, when they first came in. Um, but uh, I tried a medication, didn't really seem to do much good. So the next time they came back, uh, our spirometer was actually working and uh, did a spirometry test with them and actually found uh, signs of upper airway dysfunction. There, you know, Once you get to learn the, the curves and everything else of a spirogram, you can kind of see some other warning signs. So I started to see you know, extra thoracic stuff in the upper airway. So we sent them to an, uh, to an ENT um, and they saw massive swelling in this area. Well, it turned out that this person had had post-nasal drip for a very long time and therefore developed a chronic cough, developed a lot of inflammation and was kind of obstructed, but it was all the stuff going on up here. Nothing that a bronchodilator could really touch. So after the ENT diagnosis, we started uh, managing the post-nasal drip a little bit more aggressively. They went to see a speech therapist for a while to learn uh, how to uh, harness the cough a little bit better or you know, um, um, protect themselves against coughing a little bit better. And within about three to four months, this person was essentially symptom free again, was able to liberate from any inhaled medications and all that sort of thing. So, um, and, and their case is, is certainly, it's less common, but it's certainly not unique because we also see vocal cord dysfunction. We see all these sorts of things that again, manifest as some kind of lung problem, but it's not actually going on in the lungs. And so we can really save people a lot of hassle and a lot of strife as uh, you know as we, as we struggle through diagnoses and all that sort of thing, um, if we actually perform the correct test with, with as many people as we can. So uh, again, we do see that COPD is a bit different than asthma. Uh, again, looking at the, the age parameters here, most people with asthma tend to get it when they're relatively young. Uh, may see it manifest in childhood or certainly young adulthood. We do sometimes see adult asthma, that's true. Um, but again, to separate it out there, we rarely see any COPD uh, under the age of 40. Again, obviously smoking, three out of four, 75 to 80% of people with COPD have some kind of smoking history. Um, at least about, uh, I think our cutoff is usually about 100 cigarettes, a uh, couple hundred cigarettes. Um, whereas asthma doesn't necessarily have a direct relationship with smoking history, uh, could be other uh, environmental pollutants, could be uh, smokers in the home, things like that. Uh, with shortness of breath, we do see a bit of a progression with COPD, um, where we also see shortness of breath even when resting. We can often manage that a little bit better with asthma. You know, of course, there are the folks out there who have very brittle, very intractable asthma, uh, but we usually see their shortness of breath happening when they're exposed to a particular trigger. Uh, and then when they're removed from that trigger or when we give them, uh, uh, you know, certain uh, reliever medications, we do see that uh, shortness of breath improves. And then finally, the, the, the disease course, um, COPD does tend to get worse over time. Uh, and especially if you happen to have a flare up, an exacerbation, um, whatever word we wanna call it, uh, those usually have, uh, instead of being more of a linear progression, if you have an exacerbation, you often will take a step down, a solid stair step down in your lung function. And it's difficult to recover from that. With asthma, symptoms do come and go. Uh, most, uh, I'll say many people, uh, will function normally in between these attacks. Uh, now again, if, if it's managed properly, if it's not managed properly, we actually do see airway remodeling that can eventually lead to uh, COPD-like disease later on in life, particularly more on the chronic uh, uh, bronchitis side of things. So again, with either disease, they, they do have differences, but with either disease, maintaining control over those symptoms is absolutely crucial. So again, we see that uh, um, uh, this is one of my favorite graphs, particularly when I'm talking to people about the impact, uh, when I'm trying to, to do my motivational interviewing and get them to try to quit smoking. We see here the original version of this uh, came out in the late 1970s. This is called the Fletcher Pedo curve, where they actually looked at uh, dock workers over in Britain um, and looked at uh, their lung function, their spirometry over time. And they found that uh, everybody loses some of their lung function as you get older, which, as I tell people, makes sense. Uh, my uh, eyeglasses prescription has gotten worse as I've gotten older. My knees, so my eyes don't work as well. My knees don't work as well uh, as, as when I was younger. So it makes sense that my lungs aren't going to work as well. They did find that uh, people who smoked tended to go down a lot faster. Their, their decrease dropped a lot faster because of that smoking. 
but when people quit as represented by the uh, the dotted lines there you kind of revert back to that age related curve um, and then, of course, you know, the, the wavy line there that was added uh, in the last couple of years, uh, that uh, represents the impact of those exacerbations and, and that kind of stair step down where you get some of it back, but not all of it, and you keep uh, progressing down. So, again, the, the power of this is this is why tobacco cessation, as difficult as it may be, is so critical to uh, changing the course here. Uh, you know, I will I'll tell people I won't I can't necessarily promise you extra years to your life, um, but as you can see here, you can get some extra life to your years. And it's also important to remember that it is never too late to quit smoking. Uh, obviously, never too early, but it's never too late to quit smoking and slow down some of that progression. So once we have our diagnoses and once we have kind of our plan uh, of you know our our, our prognostic uh, kind of idea of, you know, well, how long are we going to be dealing with these issues? What do we do with this? How do we manage uh, COPD? Well, of course, the front line is medications, uh, generally inhalers. We do have one or two uh, uh, pills that are out there now, but uh, they're certainly, those are not considered frontline medications. They are people who have uh, who are less responsive to some of the medications and have kind of intractable flare-ups and things like that. Uh, but by and large, we're talking about inhalers and nebulizers. Uh, two different kinds of bronchodilators, uh, beta uh, beta agonists and muscarinic antagonists. And in many cases, we'll use inhaled corticosteroids to manage that inflammation as well. Starting to get away from that a little bit simply because we did note uh, some increased risk of pneumonia with a lot of folks uh, with COPD while using inhaled corticosteroids. And again, while the inhaled route usually keeps stuff in the lungs where it belongs, uh, if you have somebody who is on um, chronic inhaled corticosteroids for a very long time, um, as we've seen in our young asthma people, we do start to see some of those um, uh, systemic effects over time. Now, of course, a uh, great COPD advocate, a friend of mine who's been living with the condition says, uh, has said for many years, uh, the medications help me exercise, the exercise actually helps me live. And really, that's where a lot of this stuff comes down to. Um, we have a program called pulmonary rehabilitation uh, in the respiratory care world that is fantastic. It is one of the most evidence-based interventions for improving longevity and decreasing exacerbations and everything else. It works so well that uh, this past year at the American Thoracic Society meeting, they actually said, please stop sending us uh, studies and posters and journal articles and all that stuff. To, we, we, we aren't going to publish anything else about how great pulmonary rehab is because we know. Everybody knows. That's not a thing. What we have an issue with is barriers to pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, even in the best of times, uh, pre-2020, roughly one in 10, uh, maybe one in, in eight people who had COPD and who were eligible for pulmonary rehab actually took part in the program. Again, for a variety of reasons. Um, many clinicians may not be aware of it. <clears throat> Excuse me, there are transportation issues. Uh, there are programs that have had to shut down because reimbursement was relatively low for a while. And of course, after 2020, we saw a lot of places shut down for infection control reasons. Uh, but still, we need to do a better job of improving access to pulmonary rehab. And fortunately, we are seeing some virtual uh, programs popping up here and there. Uh, and we're really seeing some interesting growth in those areas. But even outside pulmonary rehab, which is monitored exercise, simply getting out and moving as best as you can makes a tremendous difference uh, in quality of life and uh, in a lot of our other outcomes measures. Of course, uh, also going along with that is quitting smoking, as we've kind of hit a couple of times here. Um, you know, again, these are the two most evidence-based uh, things to, to help improve longevity, and then you throw the meds in there, and we've got improvements in quality of life. So, um, you know, I would, again, tell people all the time, uh, the two most important things you can do are quitting, quit smoking and start moving around a little bit more, and then we'll get you on meds that will help you with that. Now, again, all of this is easier said than done, and I, I don't mean to be flip about it. <clears throat> Excuse me, man, pardon me. Um, I don't mean to be flip about it, but these really are kind of the core issues that we that we need to 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 address in order to get people back to living their best lives with uh, an ongoing constant breathing problem. 
Um, as we start getting into some of the more advanced uh, management strategies of COPD, we also do see oxygen. As mentioned, um, you know, when you when you start losing some of those alveoli, you don't have enough ability to uh, get that oxygen uh, into the bloodstream. Uh, another one of the pulmonary function tests that we do is actually called the diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide, uh, which gives us, we use a very trace amount of carbon monoxide to see how well gas can exchange through the alveolar membrane um, because we then and extrapolate out, well, if you have impairments uh, with carbon monoxide, which has about a 200% a greater affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen does, you're probably going to have issues with uh, getting oxygen across the membrane too. Um, so again, that's where you're gonna go, uh, one of those pulmonary function tests that's in a lab, but whenever you get that diagnosis or however you determine somebody needs oxygen therapy, we wanna start doing that. We wanna give people a little bit more than just the 21% that's in room air so that uh, they can keep their oxygen levels up. And again, particularly with exercise, a lot of folks start with uh, using supplemental oxygen either during sleep uh, or um, with activity, and then may eventually uh, progress to needing it constantly um, but again, that's uh, uh, really everybody's disease progress is, is fairly unique. We can see general trends and things like that, but it's really important to have individualized care. And then there's also a variety of other, other things that we can do from non-invasive ventilation uh, to help uh, unload the respiratory muscles, particularly at night during sleep and allow better recovery. Um, we even see some respiratory assist devices that can be used during exercise. Um, we see that we have uh, what we call bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, uh, where we get into placing a valve or some coils in the lungs to help uh, bring back some of the elastic recoil or, or, the, or the other factors there. Um, but uh, again, those are relatively advanced uh, uh, techniques that we would use uh, later on in the in the process here. So, all right. So as we get into uh, the, the concluding features here, we do have a couple of other tools that we can use to help. Um, on the left side of the screen here, we see a thing called the COPD assessment test, which is a well-validated test that uh, really, I would use this in the clinic on our first visit to kind of establish a baseline. And then um, on subsequent visits, I would see how we were doing with our treatment plan. This actually looks at eight different domains from uh, uh, coughing and mucus production to shortness of breath on exertion to sleep and energy level. And this really gives us an idea of uh, where somebody is uh, outside of, of just breathlessness or outside of some of the basic descriptions of their, of their issues. We also see on the right side of the screen here, uh, the COPD Foundation has created what, what we call an, a COPD action plan, um, which is very helpful for friends and caregivers and family members and everybody else because uh, this helps people understand um, whether they're having a good day, whether they're having a bad day, whether they might want to consider going to urgent care or even calling 911. Um, and just again, communicating these things with uh, not only caregivers, but with the clinical team as well. So that again, this is another measure of, uh, of, of disease management uh, and progression. Uh, we also, uh, being the, the 21st century, we have uh, what we call our Pocket Consultant Guide app. Uh, this is a free app that is available for both uh, iOS and Android um, that can be downloaded from the App Store of your choice. Um, it's a, it has a lot of great tools for managing um, COPD. Uh, we've got uh, therapy flow charts. We've got uh, inhaler uh, technique videos. Um, we've got uh, that you can actually measure the, the COPD assessment test within the app. Uh, there are two views to this app to make it uh, uh, friendly for clinicians and providers and also patients and caregivers. Uh, there are exercise videos. There are again, uh, you know, therapy plans. It's a it's a helpful tool to uh, make sure that um, uh, you're on the right track, your patients are on the right track, and everybody's kind of speaking the same language because it, it's difficult to have um, really good individualized, high quality treatment plans unless everybody is communicating openly. Um, and uh, communication between patient and caregiver and, uh, and clinician is absolutely essential here. So. Again, recognizing I'm a little biased, I think this is a, a really a unique tool and a very helpful tool uh, for a lot of folks to uh, uh, better manage uh, the, the patients under their care. So with that, I will once again thank you for uh, allowing me to, to chat at you for a little while here during COPD Awareness Month. I'm happy to, uh, we've got a, a few more minutes here to answer some questions at, at the tail end of the program. I also, if you if we're not able to get to your, your question or if you think of it later or just simply want to take it offline, I'm always open to uh, emails. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me any anytime. 
I would also invite people to check out our website at copdfoundation.org uh, because we have uh, you can get some more information about COPD Awareness Month and our current campaign called Lace Up for Lungs, uh, where we're really um, trying to get more people uh, thinking about COPD and also promoting some exercise at the same time. Uh, you can see a lot of the things that we talk about uh, with our, um, our pocket consulting guide app. We have a wealth of uh, educational materials for both patients and clinicians, uh, and uh, it's just all around a good time. So please feel free to come check that out. That's at copdfoundation.org. And again, please feel free to uh, email me any questions that uh, we don't get to today. And uh, we'll go ahead and send it back to uh, uh, thank you to all of our sponsors for the, the program today. Yeah, absolutely. Michael, that was a great presentation. So informative and um, your foundation has a lot of great tools to offer and we certainly got some great new information. I know I learned a lot. So um, again, we're going to go into the Q&A now. So if you have some questions that you want to ask of Mike, please put them in the chat box now. And while we're waiting for you to do that, I just want to, as Mike said, thank the sponsors once again, O'Connor Mortuary, uh, Care Choices, Hospice and Palliative Services, Caring Companions at Home, and Alzheimer's Orange County. I'll also mention uh, next month's uh, webinar, which is scheduled for Tuesday, January 11th. Uh, 1130 and uh, I'll be the speaker this time it's uh, the title is behavioral expressions and persons with dementia and I'll be joined by our director of education um, Melissa Klabe so uh, again that's January 11th so let me at this time go ahead and open up our question box and see what we have there uh, hang on just a second let me open Okay, so uh, one, que one question is, in addition to coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, and fatigue, um, might excessive nasal sniffing be a symptom? The person I'm concerned about sniffs constantly without actually seeming to have any nasal congestion, and I wonder if she's trying to get more air. Uh, potentially, that that's one that... Um... We don't usually talk about, but uh, I could very easily see where, you know, again, just like you're saying, you're trying to get a little bit more airflow in there. Um, specifically through the nose, I would probably look more at probably an anatomical thing or something like that, but, uh, you know, inside the, the sinuses or, or something along those lines. But um, it could be entirely possible. That would be another one of those times where spirometry would probably be very helpful in determining um, exactly where people are at with that. Um, although, again, you can look at risk factors and, you know, do it a little bit more empirically. But uh, uh, were that somebody in my clinic, I would probably say, um, let's uh, let's run, let's do a spirometry on you and uh, see what we're working with. So interesting. Great. Um, how do you differentiate asthma exacerbation uh, versus COPD? Uh, that's a $64,000 question right there. Um Honestly, a lot of that, in a lot of those cases, it'll come down to taking a history. You know, what exactly was the uh, um, the cause of the, the flare-up? Um, what's been the course of the flare-up? Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it gets a little chicken or egg because we also see, you know, somebody may have pneumonia and they may have a COPD exacerbation at the same time. Um, you know, did did the pneumonia cause the COPD exacerbation? Did they have a mild flare and so they stopped doing as much and they didn't treat the infection and it turned into pneumonia? Um, that, uh, that, that makes it tricky clinically. It makes it tricky for research purposes because we see a lot of these things that just kind of overlap with each other and run into each other. So I wouldn't say that there's a hard and fast rule for um, determining which one is which. And uh, sometimes, more often than not, I would say, it kind of just becomes kind of an academic question because a lot of our treatments are going to be the same. A lot of our supportive therapies are going to be the same. Um, and so then it, then it kind of becomes a question for the billers and coders. Okay. Uh, how prominent are vocal cord problems caused by first smoking and secondhand smoking? The vocal um, cord problems. Prominent. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm struggling a little bit with prominent um, just because 
you know, usually a vocal cord injury is going to be caused by some kind of trauma, but again, it can be a lot of that chronic irritation, um, which leads to cough, which leads to kind of micro traumas a lot over time, um, which, and I think that is probably um, vastly underrated in the setting of secondhand smoke. I, I think, I still don't think we quite give secondhand smoke the uh, the, the the weight that it, uh, that it, it deserves. Um, you know, we know that there we know that there are people who have developed COPD simply from secondhand smoke. Uh, that's not uncommon. Um, so, you know, th if we're talking about clinical presentation, I, I don't know that it would be more pro more or less prominent than you know an actual physical injury to to the vocal cords. Uh, as far as prevalence, um, it's probably also widely uh, underdiagnosed. Again, simply because it's not one of the, it's, uh, you know, there's that saying that uh, if you hear hoofbeats, you should think horses and not zebras. Vocal cord dysfunction tends to be kind of a zebra anyway. Um, and so if you if you have somebody who has the secondhand smoke exposure or a history of tobacco themselves, uh, and they have these symptoms, you know, you're automatically going to leap right to the horse of COPD or, you know, those kinds of things. So, um Again, I, I don't want to get too broken record here, but the spirometry is very insightful on helping to sort some of that out. So I, I hope that answered the question. So it's logical to assume that if a person's exposed to secondhand smoke and they develop these diseases, that it's due to the secondhand smoke, right? Uh, it's certainly not unreasonable, yes. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. What would make a patient's testing show worse results with COPD and asthma when given, um, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Oh, it might. Are, are we talking about a bronchodilator? Okay. Uh, a what, or something? what would make a patient's testing show worse results with COPD and asthma when given a ventilation medication slash inhaler? Okay. Um, yeah, I, it actually does make sense. That, that okay. is a, a relatively rare phenomenon, and it, it's usually one of two things. Um, first of all, pulmonary function testing, spirometry in particular, is very sensitive to technique. Uh, and so it, the, the most common thing, the horse, um, is just that uh, somebody did not work as hard uh, during the second test. However, uh, there is a zebra called uh, tracheomalacia. Uh, where some of the, the car cartilaginous structures of the trachea actually break down a little bit or aren't there, and it's really just the soft tissue. And at the end of the day, while we call it a bronchodilator, um, albuterol is kind of akin to a muscle relaxant because that's what it does inside the lungs, right? It, it opens up the airways by causing all that smooth muscle to relax. And so if your smooth muscle is relaxing in your throat, in your trachea, and you don't have the cartilage to support it, then all of a sudden your trachea gets real floppy. Um, and so we have seen actually people have that paradoxical response uh, after uh, the beta agonist uh, bronchodilator um, and they've ended up having tracheomalacia. Now, again, not, not terribly common. It's certainly one of the, the, the zebras out there, um, and which is why I prefaced it with a, it's usually going to be an effort issue, but it, it does happen. Okay. Great question. Uh, that, that, that's Thank always you. one of those ones that's like the... Uh, you love to hear like or you love to have in your pocket when you're talking to students or things like that because it's always the the oddball things that uh, really are interesting so thank you for that one uh, my husband has copd he's using oxygen to sleep and has a nasal canister or cannula cannula thank you he frequently gets a stuffy nose at night and can't breathe. What can I do to help him? Uh, biggest thing is humidity. Um, I would encourage anybody who is uh, any, anybody who has symptoms like that to add some humidity to their oxygen. Uh, most oxygen concentrators have a little spot where you can put in a little uh, a canister of water or water bottle or, or what have you. You can talk to your DME provider about that. Um, but that is, uh, we see that with oxygen and we see it a lot with CPAP, which has a lot, uh, arguably greater flow, uh, certainly a more, a greater volume of air. Uh, when I was using CPAP back in the day, um, my nose, it would get very similar to that and uh, a little bit of humidity um, went a long way. 
Um, sometimes things like uh, 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 water-based lubricants or things like that can help, and they can also help with some of the irritation because, again, that's some, some, sometimes what's going on. Uh, you know, it's not normal to have plastic jammed up your nose. Uh, so you, you put a little, um, make sure you're not using a petroleum-based product, but any kind of uh, water-based lubricant in there can reduce some of that irritation and keep the, the nares open a little bit better. Great. Um, can long exposure to cat dander and other respiratory allergens lead to COPD? So is there a relationship between allergens and COPD? Not well established directly, but what, what can happen, and I touched on this briefly during the presentation, was um, you know, you can get sensitized to that and develop asthma. And then if your asthma is not treated properly, you start to get a lot of that, uh, we call it airway remodeling, where you have that chronic inflammation and then that leads to ongoing bronchospasm issues and you have a lot of those things, um, which can lead to chronic obstruction. Um, so it's not necessarily point A to point B, but uh, it certainly can contribute to the development over time. Okay, can tonsillitis contribute to the beginning of COPD or make already a COPD diagnosis worse? So yeah, a lot of cause and effect stuff here. Um, not that I'm aware of. It could probably alter your um, your spirometry results a little bit. And of course, you know, whenever you have any kind of inflammation through the body, uh, you also always run the risk of that uh, that spreading a little bit and, and developing more of a systemic inflammation or at least where it manifests somewhere else. Um, but I, again, I, I wouldn't put much cause and effect on that one. Okay, you said that only 10% of people with COPD get gene testing. What is the benefit to getting tested for the gene? Well, I'll, I'll clarify a little bit. 10% um, of people with alpha-1 deficiency get diagnosed with that. Um, the, the prevalence of, of alpha-1 as a sub group of COPD is probably more like three or four percent. The benefit is um, if you are if you do have COPD and you do get that testing done, there are a couple of different uh, what they call augmentation therapies out there where you can actually get infusions of that alpha-1 antitrypsin protein. And then that again can uh, work to uh, raise your serum levels a little bit better and uh, um, potentially uh, slow down some of the damage um, as it's better to, better able to counteract that neutrophil elastase. So without the genetic testing, um, you don't really have access to those therapies and, and uh, you you won't have that that uh, same arresting of the of the uh, potential arresting of the progress. So that's that's the biggest benefit. Do you recommend people just as a standard just getting the the alpha one test? Uh, just I as do. Part of their physical. Um, if, if they've been diagnosed with COPD, the, the best practice standards from a lot of our international organizations that, that deal with lung issues is that anybody who has diagnosed obstruction should get tested. Um, because again, you know, you can do a serum test, you know, it can be part of a standard uh, lab draw as, as annual physical or, or you really just need it the one time. Um, but it also can be a cheek swab, you can get a, a finger poke, there are a couple of different formats with that. It's very easy, um, uh, it's offered free uh, to practices and to patients. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it, it's pretty easy to do. So um, there's low, low, low uh, barrier to it. So. If you're a carrier, one more alpha one question. This one's from me. If you're a carrier, are you at increased risk for COPD? Um, if you're if you're just a carrier, then then no. Okay. Um, but you. you know, again, if you connect with another carrier, then uh, offspring might be at increased risk for that. That's what happened in my family. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. I think we're at about the end there. All right. Well, these were fantastic questions. So, uh, they really, really are. Well, this one I, you you won't be able to answer because it's local. Where in Orange County could a person see a specialist regarding uh, possible COPD? But you can say what kind of doctor um, they, that would they be. Need to yeah. see. Um, you can you can always discuss it with your primary care team, but again, most people will end up seeing a pulmonologist at some point, a specialized lung doctor, um, who you know they're kind of the the people who are in the know with this. A lot of them are connected with the pulmonary function labs, um, so you can um, 
if you have questions or you have concerns, um, see about getting into a, a pulmonologist of your choice or in your network or what have you, uh, and they'll be able to answer uh, um, questions for you. Kim, you know what? We missed a couple of questions from the beginning um, yeah. that came in like super early on. Um, how does COVID relate to COPD? Did you, did, you didn't answer that one, right? No, go ahead and ask what questions I missed because uh, just like last time, I've got a, a skewed view of the of the question box. So I'm having yeah. difficulty with my view. So please go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, so, uh, for, first that one. Uh -huh. Okay, so what's been interesting about that is we know that um, if you have COPD and you get COVID-19, uh, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, the outcomes have been significantly worse, and and you know which makes sense. You know, again, you have respiratory compromise to begin with. It's a respiratory condition, so um, A plus B equals C. The interesting thing has been um, as a cohort, the COPD community that has been underrepresented in COVID patients um, because a lot of folks have been social distancing before it was cool. They've been masking before it was cool. Um, they've been taking all these precautions at baseline and be, they're well aware of their increased risks. So they've been extra diligent about it. So again, a lot of the epidemiological studies have been out there have shown that um, while you are at greater risk of, of poor outcomes, uh, you're arguably at less risk of, of getting it simply because of your existing social experiences. Okay, great. There's this uh, question, what is the relationship with women who have COPD and are victims of secondhand smoke? Um, there is one. I don't know. Again, I don't know that we've really explored that a lot, but that is not uncommon to... Um, uh, you know, have lived with a husband who smoked and uh, maybe, you know, other people who have smoked uh, for many, many years and then developed the, the condition yourself. Um, I don't have the prevalent stats off the top of my head, and I'm not sure that we've really studied that very thoroughly, but uh, um, it does happen, and it's uh, rather unfortunate in my opinion. Um, we have, want, do you want, want me to, to do any more? I just want to interrupt for okay. a second. You know, you were talking, that one slide was fascinating about the prevalence and everything. And I noticed that uh, Hispanics are at a decreased rate relative to other cultures. Um, is there any theory, are there theories related, you know, related to that? Um, some, most of the theories are, are about what you would expect, lack of access to good diagnostics, um, certain cultural issues or certain cultural con concerns, I should say. Um, you know about uh, you know is is uh, you know just related to to breathing and to breathing problems. Um, my and potentially, I don't I don't know if we've really studied this very much either, um, but uh, potentially just uh, lower uh, smoking rates or or anything like that. Um, my my gut would be um, lower access to diagnostics, honestly. Okay, okay, so l access to the proper testing and all. Let's do one more Healthcare question. Healthcare disparities. Yes, practices. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Let's do one more question, Michelle, and then I think we're we're at 12:40, so we're going to end the webinar then. So one more question. Okay. We know smoking causes COPD, but how prevalent is COPD in patients that have been subjected to radiation treatment for cancer such as lung cancer and lymphoma, Hodgkin's and not non-Hodgkin's in their past? So generally with, with radiotherapy, what we would see is kind of the, the opposite side of things, where COPD is an obstructive disease, um, the damage that might be caused by radiation would be considered a restrictive disease, where the lungs actually get stiffer, um, and sometimes that alveolar membrane will thicken up uh, and everything else. And so the, the biggest difference there is um, you actually get the air out a little bit faster because the lungs, are, you get more elastic recoil because, again, the lungs are very stiff and they don't want to expand to begin with. Um, now, the real bummer about that is uh, with these diseases that are along the lines of pulmonary fibrosis and, and that sort of thing, um, we do not have nearly as many effective therapies to manage that, uh, and uh, oxygen demands tend to be a lot higher. So um, that uh, it's not necessarily COPD, although there are some lung issues that are involved with that. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring us to a close here. We want to thank you so much, Mike, for this just really fascinating webinar. Um, 
And as a reminder, everyone, next month we'll be talking about behavioral expressions in dementia, and I'll be joined by uh, our Director of Education, Melissa Clabe. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors. Thanks to all of you for those great questions that you asked. And please watch for the survey that will open up immediately after I end the webinar. There'll all be, it'll also be pushed out by email uh, one hour after the webinar ends. Um, don't forget you can always visit our website at www.alzoc.org for information about some of our other educational events and all of the offerings that we have. Plus, you can visit um, our video library and see past uh, recordings of past uh, webinars as well. So thank you, Mike, and thank you to our audience, and everyone have a great day. Thanks, everybody.